You ever done that? Man. Uh, a lot of people try to watch out for the pastor and the family when they're on vacation and not bug them with problems that's going on. They just try to deal with it, and I appreciate that. But tomorrow, I don't plan on handling any problems. If you have a death in the family, take two aspirin, call me the next day. Uh, tomorrow, <laughs> I've always said that Monday is my day off. It never works out that way. Monday is usually my busiest day. But tomorrow, I'm planning on hanging out around the house. And I've been parted from my recliner for quite some time. And we've got a lot of catching up to do together. First Kings chapter number 17 in verse number 7 is where we'll start. I just want to say thanks to all those who have worked and filled in places and done things, all the guys that preached and, and ladies that's kept the nursery and people who were faithful to come and people just serving in all different areas. I, I just I appreciate that so much. Man, there was, I remember back in the days when we didn't have anybody to fill in for anything, you know, it was just uh, a skeleton crew. And now we've got a a good group of people who love to serve the Lord, and, and you've been doing that. And I want to say thank you, and uh, we'll remember eternally with gratitude the sacrifices you've made to do the things, to keep things rolling while we were gone. In First Kings, in chapter number 17, and we'll read there beginning with number 7. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, Elijah, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city. Behold, there the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruse of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Let's pray right there. Father, we certainly love you this morning, and we've gathered together, Lord, around the word of God. The singing's been good. The fellowship's been good. Lord, just meeting together with your family here in, in this room is such a special blessing. Now, Lord, we come to the time when we focus upon your word, and, Lord, that always should be our focus in a church service is the word of God. That's the culmination of everything that we do. And Lord, may the word reach the hearts of people and may it attain that which you have sent it to do. I pray that you'd bless us. May the Holy Spirit fill us, guide us, and show us the things you'd have us know. And Lord, help us to have the will to do exactly what you'd have us to do in our own lives because of the scripture. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Well, we started reading there in verse number 7. If we'd read the first six verses, you'd see that, that the man of God, Elijah, had pronounced a drought upon the land of Israel because God was, God was mad. Uh, the land of Israel had been indulging in idolatry. They had put God in the back ground on God on the back burner of their hearts and Israel as a whole was just backslidden and doing wrong and so God told Elijah you go down and pronounce a drought that's not going to rain for a few years and we'll see how they like that and so Elijah announced it and Ahab the king didn't much like it and he's looking for Elijah and he wants to slice his head off because this man's bringing him trouble I mean this is like the President of the United States and everything's going bad and you want to blame the king? Well, King Ahab didn't want to be blamed for the things that's going wrong in Israel, so he hated Elijah because Elijah was telling the truth. And so Elijah is commanded to go down by the brook Kareth and to sit there by this creek bank and God said, you just hang out there. You can hide out there from Ahab and don't worry about survival. I'm going to send the crows and they'll bring, you a, they'll bring you some toast and gravy and biscuits every morning. Now, you've got to read the Hebrews to get all the gravy and biscuit stuff. And so Elijah did that. He went down by the brook and he's, he's in the will of God. Did God tell him to do that? Yeah, God told him to do that. But the brook dried up. Man, he's sitting there doing exactly what God wanted him to do and the the creek goes dry. He's got no water. Have you, ever, have you ever thought that you were doing exactly what God wanted you to do and then things kind of went haywire? The brook dried up. You started tithing and man, the finances got tight. You began to witness and people started hating on you. You tried to be faithful to church but it seemed like something always came up that tried to draw you away. Well, he's trying to do what God wanted you to do, but the brook dried up. Well, that's where Elijah's at. Man, he went down there by the will of God, and he sat by the creek, and it dried up. Now, God said, don't worry about it. I'm going to send you over to Zarephath, to this widow woman's house. She's starving to death, but she's going to feed you. <laughs> Elijah said, huh? That's in Hebrew, too. And so he does exactly what God says, and he goes to the widow's house. And she's out there gathering up a couple of old tree limbs and to build a little fire. And she's going to bake what little meal. She's got maybe a double handful of meal left in the barrel. I mean, it's at the bottom of the barrel. She's scraping. You ever heard that saying, scraping the bottom of the barrel? And so she, scra she says, man, I can't feed you. I've got to scrape up this little dab of cornmeal. And it wasn't, it wasn't corn like we eat. It was just probably wheat or barley meal. And they were going to, she said, I'm going to cook this and, and my son. Now we've got a little bit of oil. I mean, we can fry some hoe cakes. And, and my son and I are going to eat that. And then we're just going to starve to death. Got nothing else to do. And so the prophet, probably a Baptist preacher, he said, well, you go ahead and do as you said you're going to do. You scrape up that little bit of meal and you use that little bit of oil and you cook up some cakes but feed me first. That's how I know he was a Baptist. <laughs> Can you imagine the audacity and the unmitigated gall of, a, of the preacher to say, wait, before you feed yourself, feed me first. Well, boy, sometimes we don't understand. But God had told him to do that. And sometimes God has you to do things that other people might not understand, but you know it's the will of God and you go ahead and do it because this is the will of God. Well, this is what happens and... There's some who say, well, preacher, why are you preaching out of the Old Testament anyway? That's, that's not written to us. It's not written necessarily to us, but it's written for us. And every part of the Bible, Timothy, in Timothy he says uh, that all Scripture is written by the will of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and all Scripture is given for us. And while it not, might not be written exactly to us, I mean, God wrote the command for Noah to build an ark. Now that's not for us to go out and start building an ark. I mean, we don't need one. He said he's not going to send another flood. So we don't need an ark, but we can learn some principles from Noah's ark that's going to help us as New Testament Christians. See, there's a difference between a precept and a principle. When God told Noah to build an ark, that was a precept. That's a command. 
Noah, do this. That's a command. Well, that command's not to us, but the precept is there. And so when God tells you to do something, you don't even understand it, but the Scripture says you ought to do it. You go ahead and just do it because that's the principle behind it. There is a timeless principle behind these precepts in the Old Testament. And in 1 Corinthians, in the New Testament, it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Now all these things happened. What things? Things in the Old Testament. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. That, and they are written for our New Testament Christians' admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. He's saying the things in the Old Testament are not necessarily in precept for you, but in principle they're for you. There's things that are commanded to the Old Testament Christian or the Old Testament believers. Like remember Abraham when he was commanded to sacrifice Isaac on the son of the, on the, his son on the altar. Well now we're not commanded to do that. Now some of you might have thought about killing your kids sometime or other. (laughs) But you're not commanded to sacrifice your child on, a, on an Old Testament altar. But there is a principle behind that precept that was given to Abraham. See, it was written to Abraham, but it's for us too. In the fact that there is a principle that nothing is too great as a sacrifice. If God calls on us to do something, it's not too great of a sacrifice. Abraham didn't want to give up his son, but he was willing to. So what do we learn? In principle, we learn that we ought to be willing to sacrifice even that which we place great value upon. We live in a self-centered world. And we live in a world that teaches us to look out for number one and that we ought to take care of ourselves first. But in Philippians it says, not, let not every man look upon his own things, but on the things of others, meaning that we ought to pay attention to others. Well, there's one primary interpretation of a passage of Scripture, but many applications. And I want us to notice a few things about this woman who reached the bottom of the barrel, living at the bottom of the barrel. You may be living at the bottom of the barrel. You may say, boy, my barrel's about empty. But she found a good life, a happy life, and a fulfilling life, even at the bottom of the barrel. We notice first the severity of her situation. I mean, things were severe. This wasn't just an inconvenience. She was about to die along with her son. I mean, it was severe. It says in... Verse 9, the first part of verse 10, it says, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. And I have, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the woman was there gathering of sticks. Now, twice it mentions that she's a widow. Her situation is pretty dire. She's lost her husband. She's lost her sweetheart. She's lost provision. In those days, it was tough to be a widow. I mean, her husband wasn't there to take care of her. He wasn't there to bring home the bacon. She's lost just about everything. And her situation is tough. We don't know how long she's been widowed, but there's one thing that's certain. She was in a tough situation. And then there was her despair. I mean... I want you to get the feel for how tough this situation was. She was in despair. Uh, It says, and she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. She said, we got nothing. Simply nothing. We got a handful and that's all. She knew that death was the next step. When she eats that biscuit, everything's gone. She was in desperate situation. Times come when you and I face desperate situations and it's very difficult. It might be money. It might be health. It might be family problems. But we face difficult situations, don't we? And everybody faces some kind of difficulty somewhere along the line. And then 
Notice her diagnosis. She said in verse 12, and she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering uh, two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. She had resigned to defeat. Do you ever feel like giving up? <laughs> Come on now, think about it. You don't have to raise your hand or say anything, but you've probably been there. When things were at the bottom of the barrel, and you just thought, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. I just can't go on. I see no hope. You've probably been there. Well, there have been some times when I just wanted to give up. And just hanging by a thread. And somehow God gave me just enough strength to say, well, I'll hang on one more day. I don't know how this is going to change. I don't know what's going to happen. It looks bleak. But I know there's a God in heaven. And I'm convinced that many people in our day face some things that didn't turn out like you planned. You thought, you thought, I've got these great plans. Hey, I thought when we planted Liberty Baptist Church 25 years ago, I thought, man, in a year's time we'll have 100, in two years' time we'll have 300, and then in five years we'll have 500 or 1,000. Things didn't turn out like we planned. You know what the average church is today? The average church is less than 100 people. I, I got a feeling there's a lot of other preachers out there says, man, I'm doing everything I know to do. I, I witness, I preach, I love people, I try to help folks, and our church is just, it's stagnant there at 100 or maybe 75 or maybe 50. Things didn't turn out like I planned. You had kids and you thought, man, I have great hopes for my kids. I believe they're going to, one of them's going to be president of the United States. Well, if they're five years old, they'd do better than the one we've got now. But things didn't turn out like you hoped. You know what we all hope? Listen to this. All of us, all of we parents, we, we think our kids are going to be special. <laughs> They're going to be the greatest kids that ever lived. You know, our kids will make us proud. They will win all the contests in school. They'll be number one at church and in junior church. And when they grow up, they'll go to Yale. <laughs> it didn't turn out that way at all. The highest education they got was at the state penitentiary. <laughs> you know, things just don't turn out always like we think it should. You've been there. You know what it's like. This widow was in a situation that was severe. But notice in the second place, the sufficiency in her situation. I'm glad the story doesn't end right here. She's looking at everything like, boy, this is it. I'm going down for the third time. And I don't see anybody's hand in sight. But it didn't end here. And we see sufficiency at the bottom of the barrel. What do we see first in this sufficiency? Well, we see faith in the Lord. Verse 13 and 14, watch this. And Elijah said unto her, fear not, Go and do. I like that fear not part, don't you? I don't see what God's going to do. I don't know what God will do to get me out of this mess. I don't know how he'll lift me up again. I don't know how he'll solve my despair and my regret and my fears. But God says, fear not. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. We're believers. And there's a God in heaven. And Elijah knows this. And he says, look woman, fear not. Not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me a make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. I sound like a selfish rascal, doesn't it? He said, I know you've got a handful of meal and you've got just a little dab of oil, but you go and make this cake and feed me. Well, I wonder what she thought. <laughs> selfish rascal. I've got enough to feed me and my boy, and he says give it to him. Well, why did he do that anyway? Because God had already told him that widow's going to sustain thee. Elijah might not have known at that point. Listen, he might not have known at exactly that point 
just what God was going to do. But he had enough faith that he believed God was going to do something to take care of the situation. And you know what else? She had faith. How do we know that? Because she went and did as he said. He believed God was going to do something and she said, well, if you're telling me God's going to do something, I'm just going to believe it too. Hey, I'm here to tell you today that I don't care what kind of situation you're in. I don't care how bleak it looks. There is a God in heaven and he has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Somehow, someday, some way, he's going to take care of you. I don't know how. I just know that he will. His promise, all the promises of in him, in God, are yea and amen. So when we get to the bottom of the barrel, we say, I think God's down there. <laughs> Living at the bottom of the barrel. You know, some of the, the best thing that can happen to you sometimes is for you to end up on the bottom of the barrel because you've got no way to look but up. <laughs> and that's when God says, okay, you've come to the end of yourself. Now I can do something to help you out. As long as you felt self-sufficient, as long as you thought you could do everything you need to have done, as long as you thought you could manipulate all the pieces of the puzzle, I couldn't help you then. But you give up on yourself and you look up to God and say, God, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. I can't do anything. Can you help me? God says, well, I've got a long arm. My arm's not shortened that it cannot save. I can reach all the way down to the bottom of that barrel and find you where you are. You may have feelings of despair, but God knows how you feel, and he knows how he can reach you. Her faith, her faith in God. <clears throat> you know what? I, as I look at all these different lessons that could be taught and preached from this passage of Scripture, I think about the faith of Elijah, a man to stand up before Ahab and, and just crow like a rooster and says, Thus saith the Lord... <laughs> There's going to be a drought in the land. And it's because of you, Ahab. I think, man, what faith, what courage. And I want to preach on that. And then I look at how he runs out of food and water there at the brook. And God says, go on over there. I've got a widow that's going to feed you. She ain't got no food, but she's going to feed you. And Elijah gets up and says, okay, I'll go. He's just obedient to the Lord. He just does what God wants him to do. And he just figures God's going to take care of it somehow because he promised. Had he not given Elijah his word, I will sustain thee there at the widow's house. Doesn't sound very promising except God can do anything and he can do anything in your life. I think about the other lessons. I think about this woman. She's got nothing and here's a Baptist preacher wanting what little she's got but she's got enough faith to say, well, he says God's going to take care of it, so I'm going to go and fix the guy some gravy and biscuits. <laughs> Me and my son will wait till last, as though there would be something there. But she had faith. She had faith enough to do what God said. Let me ask you this question. When God wants you to do something hard, when God wants you to do something that just doesn't make sense, will you do it? <laughs> well, See, it's not the same when your belly is growling and there's no food on the table. That's the test of faith. See, I say, I'll starve for the Lord. Yeah, I can say that as long as my belly's full. But when my belly's growling, I ain't ate for a few days. And then I say, I'll just do whatever you want me to do, Lord. That's a little bit tougher. You know what I mean? I think of all these things... And this woman, I, I think, man, I'd like to preach on this woman. I mean, she's willing to do for others instead of herself. Do you know what God blesses a lot of the time? Is when we do for others and put them first instead of ourselves. <laughs> she put that guy first. She put Elijah first instead of herself. And God blesses that. I think about Rod and Elise building the uh, ramp for Miss Mary Hopkins last week. And they sent me a picture of it. It looks real nice and it's solid. The old one's about to fall through. And uh, we worked over there uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
two or three weeks ago, and we realized they needed some deck work done. And of course, we were off gallivanting out in Colorado, seeing the beauties of Colorado and the great mountains and forests of Kansas. <laughs> You've seen that state a lot, haven't you, Brother David? <laughs> yeah. They ain't, even, they ain't even a corn stalk standing out there now. <laughs> We're all gallivanting around and Rod and Elise go over and build on that deck. I think, I put others, put others first. That's good. I think about people, we have people in our church that are doing stuff like that all the time. Brother Jameson and Sarah, while we were gone taking some meals to different people who were either sick or shut in, couldn't get out or having difficulty or something, they took meals to them. They put others first. And that's what God blesses is when you get your focus. See, a lot of the times we get depressed and get in despair because we're looking inside. Are you with me? We're thinking about, oh, woe is me. Look how bad I've got it. But when we look around and see how others have it and we focus on them and somehow God comes and just brings joy to our heart as we help others and put others first. God's good. He did that for the widow here. Man, she's at the bottom of the barrel, but she followed the Lord anyway. It says, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. Say, ain't no preacher going to tell me what to do. Well, she did. <laughs> she went and did as Elijah said. She figured, this guy knows the Lord. I better do what he says. She didn't try to second guess him. Christian, you may be you may be waiting for God to perform some great miracle before you trust him more. Can I just, just tell you this? That when you trust him first, then you're more likely to see the miracle. You see, she hadn't seen any new oil yet. She hadn't seen any new meal yet. She went and obeyed the Lord first. And then... She saw the miracle. Did you get that? She did obedience to the Lord and then she saw the miracle. You might not be able to see how God's going to get you out of it, but you just go ahead and say, Lord, I'm going to do what you say. I don't know if going to church is helping me any or not, but the preacher said that the word of God says that we ought not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, so I'm just going to go to church and see if anything happens. Well, you just be faithful to him and he will show up when you need him. You be faithful to God and he'll perform the miracles. I might be talking to somebody who's out there and just watching on the internet. I'm going to stare at this camera. I'm not looking at y'all, Mr. and Mrs. Sutton. <laughs> I'm talking to some people out there. Am I in the camera there? Am I too close? Got to back up a little? How's that? All right. I might be talking to somebody out there. You have no hope of eternal life. You've heard about Jesus, but you've neglected him. And you're thinking maybe in your heart, if God would just show me some big miracle, then I'd believe. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He doesn't say, wait for a miracle. Believe and God will bestow his grace. If you want to be saved, believe first and then God will work in your life after that. Christian, we may need to just Practice our faith by saying, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, but I'm going to just follow you. We're commanded to have faith in the Lord. And then verses 15 and 16, we see the favor of the Lord. God honored her faithfulness. It says, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. They couldn't see it before. But boy, they look back and say, man, our barrel was dry. We were at the bottom of the barrel. But somehow we've been eating all these days. I, look, I don't know. I don't know if that barrel ever filled up with meal. I don't know if that cruise of oil ever spilled over. It might have just been that each time she reached in that barrel... To get a handful of meal, there wasn't but a handful there, but it was there. <laughs> and see, you may think, God ought to just fill my barrel up. No, he may give you a handful at a time. 
You may think that God ought to just shower blessings down on me. I want to be a millionaire. No, he may just give you enough. When you're faithful and loyal to the Lord, he may just give you enough to live to a month, but then there's another month there. <laughs> hey, my wife and I have done that so many times. We've given sacrificially to the Lord and thought, boy, <laughs> here's the bottom of the barrel. We won't be able to do this next week, I don't guess, but we're just going to go ahead and obey God. And somehow, it was there. Our church, Brother Paul, over the years, been <laughs> him and he and Dee have taken care of the finance, keeping up with the finances of the church. And I don't know how many times we've sat down in the church office and said, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be able to make next month's payments or not. We just barely squeaked by. We got everything paid this month, but boy, next month looks bleak. We couldn't see where he's going to come from. <clears throat> we don't have any doctors and lawyers. We don't have any millionaires. <clears throat> we don't have any real well-to-do people, but somehow God uses his people to bring in a handful of meal, and we get by one more month. And the more we trust him, the more he does. Miraculously, he does it. God honored that widow's faithfulness. God honored Elijah's faithfulness. And, we, and that's why we see the sovereignty of her situation. The sovereignty of God showed up. Nobody else. They couldn't do it. They didn't know anybody else that could do it. But God could do it. God, see, listen. God has a plan. Verses 7 through 9. Uh, God had a plan when he put Elijah over by the creek. God had a plan. He knew the brook was going to dry up. And he knew he was going to send Elijah over to the widow's house. God knew all that. He had a plan. Elijah didn't see the whole plan. The widow didn't see the whole plan, but God knew. And God has a plan in your life. You don't know what it is completely. And you may just discover it little by little. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps, not the journey. <laughs> the steps. Here's what it's like. Listen. Following the Lord is seeing His will to put one foot forward. You say, Lord... I don't see how you're going to get me any further than that. God said, don't worry. Put that left foot forward, and I'll take care of the rest. And so you do it. So, all right. And then you get that foot up there, and then the Lord says, take another step now. He said, well, I'm not sure where that foot's going to land. He said, put your foot forward. And so you take another step and another step. And he might not show you where your steps are going to end up, but he can show you where the next step is. That's the way God works. See, he knows what the overall plan is, and all we got to do is just take the next step. What does he want you to do in your next step? God has a plan. God has a purpose. He had a purpose to sustain both Elijah and the widow woman and her family. He had a purpose to sustain them, and he had a purpose to strengthen them. You see, when you're going through tough times and you're at the bottom of that barrel, man, I mean, you're all the way at the bottom. You think, this is killing me. No, it's not. If you'll trust in the Lord, He will strengthen you. The hard times come for strengthening. He has a plan, He has a purpose, and His plan is to sustain thee and to strengthen thee. When you're going through a tough time, don't try to jump out of it. Not against God's will. Just stay in it and you'll come out stronger. Do you think after Elijah saw God do that by the brook Kareth, feed him by the messenger crows? Do you think after that and then God says, go over to the widow's house that ain't got nothing and I'm going to feed you there? And Elijah went over there and sure enough he got fed. Do you think his faith was ever the same again? I say he came out strengthened. Boy, anytime you go through hardship, when you come out on the other side, if you've put your faith in God, he'll bring you out stronger on the other side. He has a purpose. So I ask you, are you living at the bottom of the barrel now? Health, finances, family, job. You say, man, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. 
Good. <laughs> That's where God can reach down and find you when you've come to the end of yourself. Living at the bottom of the barrel is not such a bad thing. It's where God can show up. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you, you sustained both Elijah and the widow and her son. But Lord, we see a greater lesson there that you're faithful to your people. And when we obey you, even not knowing what two steps down the path might be, somehow you have a plan and a purpose and you're going to bring us out better on the other side. Lord, some are called on to endure more than others. We understand that. And Lord, we realize that there's some who, like Job, may suffer great loss, but yet come out stronger and more faithful on the other side. I pray for those Christians who are struggling right now that they find hope and help in this story about Elijah and the widow woman. Lord, I pray for those who are lost and don't have the hope of heaven. And they've been struggling to try to bring about things themselves. They've been hearing about maybe some catastrophe that's coming in the future that we know to be the tribulation. And they're just trying to buy supplies to survive it. And Lord, they don't know that what they really need instead of the supplies is they need you. And I pray that you'd convict their heart right now about the fact that Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sins and that he can lift them up out of the bottom of the barrel. He can lift them up out of the miry clay and set their feet on a solid rock. Lord, I pray that they'd realize that you can do all that for them. I pray you'd save their soul. Help them just, even though they don't want, know what the next step would be after trusting you as Savior, I pray that they'd take that step today and then you can show them the next step. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you please stand with me if you're able?